Country Tracks at 11 after BBC One gets you talking with Sunday Morning Live. This week, a couple defending their home against alleged burglars fired a shotgun at them, injuring two. A disproportionate response? Or do intruders forfeit their human rights when they break into a home? Good morning, I'm Samira Ahmed. Welcome to Sunday Morning Live. This week, a house owner picked up his legally registered shotgun and fired it at intruders in his home, injuring two and frightening the intruders away. He and his wife have been told they will not face charges, but were they right to defend their property by force, or was their reaction dangerously out of proportion? One of Britain's most famous scientists, Professor Richard Dawkins, says God is a delusion. Science and religion are incompatible. The Chief Rabbi, Lord Sachs, argues they do work together. Can science and religion both be right? Also this week, four British Christians have gone to the European Court of Human Rights, claiming they suffered religious discrimination at work. Andrew Marsh of Christian Concern believes Christianity itself is under threat in this country. Many of us think of Britain as a Christian country, but I believe that a new and aggressive form of atheism is in danger of making us an anti-Christian country. But well, a very warm welcome to all my guests this week. Francesca Stavrakopoulou is Professor of Hebrew Bible and Ancient Religion at the University of Exeter. She describes herself as an atheist with huge respect for religion. Andrew Copson is the Chief Executive of the British Humanist Association. He campaigns for an open society without faith schools, religious privilege or discrimination. And businessman Malcolm Starr has led the campaign to free Tony Martin, the farmer who was convicted of shooting dead a burglar running from his home in 1999. Welcome to all of you. And we want to know what you think, so call in now to challenge our guests on Skype. You can give your views on Twitter or by phone. Phone calls cost up to five pence a minute from most landlines. Calls from mobiles may cost considerably more. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate. Police this week arrested Andy and Tracy Ferry after two alleged burglars were shot at their farmhouse in Leicestershire. The Crown Prosecution Service has decided not to press charges against the couple, but the incident has reignited the debate on what counts as reasonable force in defending your home. Last Sunday, Andy Ferry fired a shotgun at alleged burglars who then fled his farmhouse in Leicestershire. No one suffered life-threatening injuries, but Mr Ferry and his wife did face lengthy questioning by police. However, later, the Crown Prosecution Service announced they would not be charged. The CPS said they had acted in reasonable self-defence. But other high-profile cases of homeowners defending their property have had very different legal outcomes. In 2000, the Norfolk farmer Tony Martin was sent to jail. He killed a 16-year-old intruder by shooting him in the back as the teenager and his accomplice were trying to flee. Now, new laws will come into effect, strengthening the rights of the householder. The Ministry for Justice says you will now be allowed to use reasonable force to protect not just yourself, but also your property. Burglary is a despicable and hateful crime. I've been burgled twice. You feel completely violated when someone has smashed their way into your house and stolen your possessions. Burglary is not bravery. Burglary is cowardice. In 2010, the Prime Minister said burglars leave their human rights outside the door. But how far should we go? If it's only our property under threat, is it really right for us to be the aggressor and possibly even kill? Many argue that a change to the law will just lead to burglars arming themselves in the expectation of being attacked. Do homeowners who attack intruders just promote vigilantism? Is it a disproportionate reaction? Or should we all have the right to defend our property using any force? Malcolm, was it right for the ferries to shoot at those intruders? Absolutely. They didn't have a rehearsal for what was going to happen. The burglars had the advantage of a, re of a rehearsal. It was also disgusting. They were taken into custody for questioning because they've had the draw trauma of these people coming into their house and then they're taken away by police. I think it's an outrage and it's about time a top judge said how brave it 
was of them to defend themselves. Thank you. Well, that's the question for today's vote. Should we be allowed to use any force to protect our homes? If you think we should, then text the word vote followed by yes. If you disagree, text vote followed by no. Our text number is 81771 and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You can also vote online or on our website. And for full terms and conditions, visit bbc.co.uk slash Sunday Morning Live and we'll show how you voted at the end of the programme. Um, Francesca, there is this real anger about this case, and particularly what Malcolm referred to there, this judge who talked about, in a separate case, um, it requiring a sense of courage to carry out burglaries. Um, I mean, do you think that you do give up your human rights if you cross a threshold and start robbing? Of course not. Oh, I sorry, carrying out a burglary, I should say. No, I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. As soon as we get to a point whereby the state is endorsing violence against somebody else, then I just think it's the thin end of the wedge. I cannot believe that anybody should be able to harm another person just in order to, to defend material property. I, I, Self-defence, if you're personally being harmed, I can understand the will and the need to fight back. But to endorse it in law, it's ridiculous. Malcolm, I mean, you, you campaigned for uh, Tony Martin and you had your own experience, didn't you? Of, that's of right, a and I can say that the only people that can really judge this is someone that's had that experience because you don't know how you're going to react. Some people would probably die of fright, some people would run away, and some people will be so angry they will do something about it and frightened at the same time. Tell us briefly what happened in your case. Uh, we had an intruder in the house that was upstairs while we were in the kitchen. Uh, it seems unbelievable to think that someone had the audacity to be in the house. Um, I, uh, the next thing I knew, that in the hallway, he had got his arms around my wife. I had a two-foot um, metal torch. I hit him over the forehead, which seemed to stun, stun him momentarily. He then said, I've got a gun, at which point I didn't take any further action. But uh, when the police arrived, I was so hyped up, I said to one of the officers that I, it wouldn't bother me if I'd have killed him. Now, a year later, uh, you perhaps don't feel like that. It's all borne off, you know, that, that experience and the hatred. But at that very point, how do you know how you're going to react? And it's unfair it's to instinct. judge the innocent householder. I mean, what do you think, Andrew, having heard of a personal experience? There is fear about the idea of you, mm. you take violent action but can you see the idea of an instinctive violent response yeah i think it's it's the instinct that we have the fight or flight impulse is one that we have and some people um assessing uh, the situation choose to fight but i think that um that case actually supports to some extent what francesca's saying because in that case someone was clearly presenting a physical threat to the person of you know of of, of your wife um if not to yourself and i think there is a real ethical distinction and therefore a legal distinction to be made between threats to your person mm. and threats to your property but i think the main ethical question is whether or or not you know, it, the response is proportionate. If someone comes and tries to snatch your, your bag um, or mug you or whatever, it's definitely proportionate to push them away and to hold on to your bag and to, and to fight them off. But it's not proportionate to you know, knock them to the ground and kick their head in. And I think but we you need don't to find know what you're going analogy. to do. No, you, I, you agree. Absolutely I agree. You can have no idea any of you what you'll do. But then the law has to deal with you afterwards. And so okay. we have to decide when we're sort of in a calmer moment. I mean, people, people kill you know, uh, on the street in fits of rage even when they're not personally yes. threatened. Again, they're in the moment. But we're not but we talking have to about a judgment. threat to your property, someone coming into your house when there's people in there, because they then can become a threat to the people in the house. I agree with that. Okay. Well, I want to bring in um, a contributor now uh, called Steve Cattell, who's actually a former burglar and, and was a gambling addict as well. Um, we've heard the view of someone who suffered a burglary. What's your view as someone who used to carry them out about the idea of, of force being used against burglars? Um, I, I, I believe it's absolutely... I, I believe it's abs it's, um, it's the wrong thing to do, uh, to commit a burglary to start with. But to enforce uh, violence upon the burglar is, um, is going to be um, a two-way thing, that the burglar is prepared when he goes into the premises if the occupants are there He's going there to use um, force uh, to take what he wants. Did you ever and use force or go prepared for, you, for violence? Yes. Um, and that was part of it, uh, of the life that I had. But then again, what your panel are not touching on at the moment is, is that I would have said 90% of burglaries today are committed um, to subsidise drug addiction. And drug addiction is a very powerful addiction. And if you try to tackle somebody that actually is out there to get their drugs, 
then it's not a matter of uh, fleeing, it's a matter of being able to take what you've gone there to get to feed that drug addiction. So it wouldn't and have made any difference to you if you knew that uh, a, a householder was likely to be allowed to use you know, more force? That wouldn't have put you off because of an addiction? No, I mean, criminal, uh, uh, forensic criminal psychologists will tell you that burglary is one of the most addicted crimes that you can do. Um, if I, I couldn't stop doing the life that I did. Um, it's as simple as that, okay. it, until I actually got the right kind of help. Malcolm, um, I, had I, I I'm sorry, that, Steve, um, I, just, I just want to get Malcolm to respond. Thank you so much. You know, what do you make of that? A lot of burglaries are carried out by addicts of, of different kinds. Isn't there a danger that you just up the ante well, the and first, there's weapons all around? The first thing is about the other judge that you spoke about. It can't be that brave if you take some drugs and you can keep mm. burgling people. That, that's nonsense, what he said. Um, again, I think we're talking here about the innocent uh, householder and not necessarily the problem the burglar's got. And I, the last thing I'm bothered about when someone comes into my property is the addictions or problems the burglar has. They should be dealt with separately and they should be dealt with by some other means, but not accusing the householder of committing a crime because he's defended himself. I want to bring in Chris uh, Birkbeck here, who's a professor of criminology from Salford University. Malcolm's raised an interesting point, which is a sense of competing victimhood, that when a burglar gets brought to trial, suddenly they're a victim, you know, and they have all that backup, and that householders and their, their situation is perhaps played down, and that's why they feel the need to perhaps take force for action in their homes. Um, yes, good morning. I think um, there is that sense and you have to separate very carefully the incident itself from what happens afterwards. There is no doubt that because the home is a private space and as other contributors have said, it's very difficult to predict how people will react and I think everybody is in agreement that most people feel that an intruder in their house is a very frightening experience. But as also your contributors have said uh, what the householder does depends greatly on the circumstances which is why the police and the crown prosecution service look very carefully at it and one thing is reacting in the in a moment of panic and uh, perceived imminent threat and another thing is uh, pursuing somebody for example to uh, 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 vent punishment on them for what you think has happened and um, so uh, there is a point at which the person who's suffered a crime can themselves commit a crime in response if they're not careful. That's the problem. Francesca, what do you think? Well, I think that's a really important point, primarily because if uh, we were to go ahead with new regulations that would allow people to, to be forceful in challenging burglars in their own homes, I mean, it is going to up the ante. A burglar is going to come into a house knowing that the person they're burgling now has the right to attack them physically. They're going to be more violent and aggressive. The household is going to be more violent and aggressive. Where do you draw the line between defending your property and pursuing a burglar down the garden with a shotgun? I mean, I, I, I just we think it's ridiculous. should invite them in for a cup of tea then and be nice to them, perhaps. Well, let's get a police perspective on this. Um, we have Sarah Newton joining us as well as a contributor. You're a former police officer. Um, where do your sympathies lie in this situation with the offenders in cases like this or with, with, with victims who feel that the law perhaps is more interested in the, in the victimhood of the burglar? I think crime is a horrible thing and there's more than one victim. You know, there is the victim that's in the home in burglary, but I think every criminal is also a victim and of some description. And while crime is horrid, I think if we start to say it's okay to do whatever we want, I think we're in a very awful society, one that I really would to live in to be honest absolutely in, in your experience um, has it always been clear-cut when a, uh, in a burglary have you had a situation where a homeowner's used force and is it obvious when they've crossed the line I think you know the law is obvious it says whatever is reasonable and that will change in every circumstance and I know that you know every homeowner will react differently but you know reasonable force is reasonable force it's quite simple that isn't chasing someone down after the burglary to attack them you know that is not reasonable um, I want to bring in, thank you so much, I want to bring in Nick Freeman, who's a criminal defence lawyer. Uh, we've heard from the police, we've heard from victims, and we've heard from former burglars. Um, isn't there a sense in which burglars have the, have the best of both worlds? They can go armed, they can try it on, and they can count on the fact that householders will be frightened of, of attacking them. 
You're absolutely right. Um, it is a burglar's world, and of course there's a very low detection rate as well. Uh, and the law is misplaced in favour of the burglar rather than the victim. Um, the law at the moment allows reasonable force, but it's through the eyes of the householder. But, but the difficulty is, of course, it's a fluid situation, and do we really trust a burglar when he says, look, I'm not going to hurt you, I'm not going to harm you? you know, what happens if he says, where's the safe, and we don't have a safe? Uh, so in my view, the householder should be allowed to use force, the force that he feels is reasonably necessary, which is very different from the law as it currently stands. And that would enable the householders to deal with the problem instinctively without wrestling with the legal potential legal ramifications that he subsequently will face. The, these two people who were arrested last Sunday spent two or three days in police custody before the Crown, Crown Prosecution Service very sensibly decided that no action was going to be taken against them. And very briefly, when you heard of that judge who talked about it taking courage to carry out burglaries, were you impressed? Uh, well, I, I think he's now being investigated, and I think he probably is. He recognised at the time, very much regrets those words. They're the most ridiculous words I think I've ever heard a judge say for many, many years, and I have heard some ridiculous words from judges before. Nick Freeman, thank you. Um, Malcolm, I mean, what are your thoughts, having heard a few different perspectives? Is it enough that it's, the law gives reasonable force protection? I don't think you can change the law. This comes up every time an incident happens, and I still think you have to perhaps put a warning out to burglars that they're going to lose a lot of their rights the, the, the moment they step into someone's property. I, I can't think you can tackle it any other way. But I think the most important thing is to, to make sure that we sort of counter this social attitude that quite a few people have that somehow cast burglars and, and other people that commit minor crimes like this as somehow villains or, or bad people. I mean, I completely agree with what Sarah had well, said on, on Skype. Bad people. But they're not inherently bad. People are driven to these sorts of yeah. situations through their own so personal circumstances. But then that's got they're to be sorted out. It's not my well. problem if they come into my property. You don't say, have you got a social problem that needs working out? You've got a problem yourself. No, but I think we would have the social problem if we started to say that burglars should have their human rights amended somehow. We might have, but I think it's far better to, for them to go to court and see if they have any rights rather than t to take innocent householders and put them in custody almost for three I mean, days. I think that's right. That must be right, isn't it? Because, I mean, I instinctively, I'm in sympathy with your general position and the people who've said that everyone's you know, a victim. Well, that's true to some extent. These things are very complex. Everyone has a difficult time. Um, and these uh, crimes are consequences of difficult situations sometimes. But it is also the case that that's a job for society, really. It can't be the, the, you know, the role My of the person, yeah, the person who's in the heat of the moment to juggle those things. I think the only ethical question there is, is their self-defence sort of proportionate mm. or did they, um, you know, go too far and become the aggressor? And I think that's, that's where the I think question. the law as it currently stands is appropriate. It's about reasonable force and each case should be tested I mean, were you arrested when you defended your wife? No, but what I, well, when go, I said to the reasonable... police officer, uh, because there was uh, no one injured, um, when I said to the police officer at the mo that moment I could have killed him, he said, oh, you better not do a Tony Martin. So <laughs> almost the police are taking the you attitude that you might have done something wrong yourself, which is nonsense. We have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your thoughts and some really terrific contributions. Um, that's our poll question today, and I just want to read you a couple of uh, your comments before I go into it. Burglars are still humans, says Johnny. It's uh, not right for other human beings to decide whether the burglar lives or dies. Lee says if you give homeowners the right to defend their property, burglars are more likely to carry weapons themselves. And Sarah says when resistance becomes aggression, we are in danger of using too much force. So the poll question today is, should we be allowed to use any amount of force to protect our homes? If you think we should, then text the word vote, followed by yes. If you think we shouldn't, then text Text vote followed by no. Our text number is 81771 and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. Or you can vote online by going to our website bbc.co.uk slash Sunday Morning Live. You've got around 20 minutes before the poll closes. Now, if you believe in God, can you really believe in science? The Chief Rabbi, Lord Sachs, believes you can and that we need both science and religion to answer the big questions. This week, a BBC documentary pitches him head-to-head -head with the man best known for leading the scientific attack on religion, Professor Richard Dawkins. I think religion hinders science because religion is content to lie down and accept supernatural explanations, whereas science sees a challenge whenever we don't understand something, the challenge is to try to understand it. Science gives us enormous power. 
Religion gives us an enormous heritage of human wisdom as to how best to use that power. And the conversation between them is a conversation that may involve each of us moving outside our comfort zone, but it's a conversation that is a signal of hope. Both scientists and theologians are interested in the big questions, and rightly so, and that's where we agree. Um, religion answers on the basis of faith, science answers on the basis of evidence, and that's by far the biggest difference. There are plenty of good scientists and indeed great scientists who believed in God and who still believe in God. Einstein had an almost mystical belief in God, creator of the universe, although he did not believe in the God of the prophets who speaks to human beings. Um, but his religious belief uh, was profound and almost mystical. You can point to individual scientists and individual good scientists who do have a belief in God. Um, but we do know that the human mind is capable of dividing itself into separate parts and of holding incompatible beliefs. And so the mere fact that you can find individual scientists, even good ones, who are religious, doesn't mean that there's any kind of great compatibility between science and religion. I think religion is our greatest set of answers to the three fundamental questions that any reflective human being must ask. Who am I? Why am I here? How then shall I live? Those questions cannot be answered by science. So do science and religion play complementary roles in society? Or are they in competition? If you truly believe in science, can you really believe in God? And you can see that documentary, Rosh Hashanah, Science versus Religion, presented by Lord Sachs this Wednesday on BBC One at 11.15pm. Now, if you have a webcam, you can make your point on Skype or you can join in the conversation on Twitter, phone, text or email. The details are all on the screen. And joining us is Steve Fuller, who's an American philosopher and sociologist who believes in God and has written about the theory of intelligent design. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start with you, Andrew, uh, yeah. really. Can a good scientist really believe in God? Well, I think that that's, I mean, I think that's a, a question that you can answer just by looking around and saying, yes, obviously there are people who are good scientists who also um, believe in God and are religious. And I think the, in the video you've just shown, Richard Dawkins made a good point about that, which is to say, people can believe, you know, different things at different times. Human beings are complicated. Um, you know, you can believe on the one hand that there is a God and on the other hand be a totally competent, maybe even brilliant um, physicist or biologist or chemist or whatever. I think the interesting question is, um, are there, is it legitimate, are the people who claim that religion can answer the same questions that science can answer, is that a legitimate claim for them to make? And I think no. I think if you, if you are a religious person who believes that your religion will answer questions like where did uh, human beings come from, um, what is you know, the behaviour of, of matter in this world, what is true about the physical universe and so on, and there are some religious people who think that. I think the religious people who think that are wrong and that the only way of answering those questions, you know, what is this uh, world all around us, how do these things behave, even historical questions like what is it that happened in the past, um, you know, what is the truth of this or that story in the past, you have to answer those questions with evidence and with hypotheses and with a scientific method. Uh, Steve, this is the big concern that uh, Dawkins is saying we need evidence and there's a growing movement of creationists and indeed people talking about intelligent design, which he argues is not real evidence and it's, it's in danger of damaging um, science scientific thinking and, and rational thought? Well, I think that in a sense uh, the history of this is completely wrong, that in a sense we wouldn't have modern science as we do today if it weren't for certain kinds of religious attitudes that took hold in the 17th century. But if you bring it forward, it's not enough to say, well, that's how it was then. If you bring it forward well, to now, is there not a threat from creationist thinking I don't challenging see it, science? I, see, I actually don't see it as a threat. I think the bigger threat is whether we believe in science at all, especially in this large-scale sense of being able to come up with a unified theory of everything. I happen to believe in that, and this is the sort of thing physicists still go after. But the whole meaningfulness of that kind of project is predicated on the idea that we actually can get a rational grasp of the entire universe. Now, why do we even have that kind of idea? That idea goes back to the, to the biblical idea that we have been created in the image and likeness of God. Because that's really the only clear precedent for the idea that human beings are so special with regard to the possibilities for understanding how the world works. Um, Francesca, you're an atheist. Um, what's your view of the kind of Richard Dawkins position? 
Firstly, I think Richard Dawkins does a real disservice to atheists. Um, though I'm an atheist myself, Why? I think he represents a point of view that deliberately caricatures and vilifies certain religious beliefs. Um, I don't hold to those beliefs myself, but I think he completely misunderstands what religion is trying to do, and particularly what these biblical ideas are trying to express about the world. So, not a big fan of his. Um, but you think what he deliberately confuses what is metaphor and is no, not... No, I just don't think he understands understood. it. I honestly don't think he literally. understands biblical literature at all. I think, um, you know, he's a scientist. He's not been trained to read these texts in their historical, social, cultural context. And but th but there is I think some, that shows. I, I, to back this up, I think it is... There was a... T if you go back to the 17th century, the people who were the founders of modern science actually did read the biblical text. So the point was, these two things have not always been so separated and so incompatible as they seem now if you listen to somebody like Richard Dawkins. Um, and so in a sense that, you know, one needs to go to, let's say, the late 19th century where you start to see this kind of schism taking place okay. that we see now. Yeah. Andrew, yeah, I mean, if you go back in time to, to, to a point at which society was drenched with Christian ideas and when also Christian ideas are very political as well, so you had to really say you were a Christian, even if you weren't really, to participate in intellectual and public life, then of course you'll find a mixing together of these things. It's true that Isaac Newton, you know, um, believed in God, but he also believed in alchemy. That doesn't mean that alchemy is now also really legitimate and we should be looking at that um, to, to inform our, our scientific thinking. I think thinking. that's a really important point, is that people now, pe people like Dawkins present science as somehow factual, this is the truth, yes, this is evidence. Yes, to be fair to Dawkins, he right. doesn't say it has all the answers, he just says its job is, is to find, to ask questions, and where it doesn't have answers, he's worried about faith, he thinks, you know, making up stuff yeah. to fill in as the gaps. Absolutely, right. yes, but I think he risks being as dogmatic as some okay. of the more conservative yes. Christians are. He's oh. imposing one ideology and, uh, and in I place of another. The, image of, the, the image of religion is being short-sold here in terms of its cognitive aspirations. Right. I want to bring in a contributor here, uh, joining us is Professor Steve Jones, who's, uh, I think, Emeritus Professor of Genetics at University College London. Um, I know that, um, Steve Jones, I know that you've written in the past about your concern about a minority of students who were walking out of biology classes because it clashed with their views on creationism. Can you tell me what you think is your view about the relationship in the modern world between some religious thinking and science? Is there any danger in, in religious thinking? Yes, I think there's an enormous amount of danger in, in religious thinking. Um, you know, I live in the 21st century, not the 16th century or the 1st century, as many of your contributors seem to. And if you look at the interaction between science and uh, religion now, there's a very useful word which is called the endarkenment, which is the opposite of the enlightenment. We now have a new inspissated ignorance which is being fed to young people by people who are probably by pastors imams and the like who probably don't believe what they're saying really but they feel they have to say it my my concern really is what happens to you let's say you're at the age of six or eight or what have you and your religious leader tells you that the earth began 4004 bc in a magical way and you believe him of course you would then you get to be 16 and you're doing biology at university and you discover he wasn't telling the truth why should he be telling the truth about anything else um, do you want to take that steve I, I think Steve Jones is mischaracterizing what's happening now. I think, as a matter of fact, what's taking place is that people are getting uh, knowledge about science through many different sources more than ever before. Um, and there's, a, you know, through the internet, through popularizations, through television programs like this and other related things. And I think people are beginning to form their own views. And I think in that re in that context, religious organizations have played a very important role. But I would say that this is not anti-science at all that's happening. I think it's, it's sort of, it's science is undergoing its own Protestant reformation where there's a decentralization of scientific authority. So the people like Steve Jones represent sort of, you know, the popes and archbishops, as it were, right. of the old Catholic Church, only with regard to science. But now we're getting a more democratized science environment to which religion is contributing. Steve Jones, a more democratized environment to science, do you accept that? Um, science isn't a democracy. That's the one thing it's not. Um, you, if you were a democracy, you often hear this in the media. A top scientist is uh, interviewed, a mathematician, who's discovered the two and two is four. Then we have somebody else who thinks from the duodecimal liberation front that two and two is five, and we end up with a compromise that is between four and five, probably nearer to four. Science doesn't work like that. It moves onwards. We accept things. If they're wrong, we, we, we throw them out. But we do not work by the, the majority. In the United States, more than half the population believes that the Earth began 4,000 years ago. That's not true, full stop. 
Steve Jones, thank you. I want to bring in another uh, scientist who's the uh, Reverend Professor David Wilkinson, uh, who's now an ordained Methodist minister. Uh, we've heard this discussion about you know, you've had Steve Jones there explaining his real concern about how religion is, is messing the way that science is regarded. Um, what's your view? My view is that um, sometimes religion can suppress science, but in my own experience as an astrophysicist and as a Christian believer, the two have liberated each other. That is, that I've become more excited about science and more excited about Christian faith as I go on. And that's because I believe that evidence uh, is involved in both science and Christian faith. And you have to look at it, uh, although they look at the universe in different ways, they share a, an interest in evidence. So for instance, I was drawn to the Christian faith at the age of 17, as it happens, because of its emphasis upon evidence, religious experience in lots of different people, the fact that the universe itself poses questions which science itself can't answer, such as where do the beauty and intelligibility of the physical laws come from, and most importantly for me, the evidence of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the claim that it's God. There's no evidence, that. That it's God. <laughs> there's no evidence yes. for that. Uh, Professor Wilkinson, I want Andrew See, to come in. Think, Go on, what did I you just think, say? That, well, there's, there's no, no evidence, evidence for that. that. I mean, Francesca will know more about this than I do as, as a scholar of the Bible, but of course there's substantial evidence that most of, of the Bible, well, there's, there's a lack of evidence that most of the Bible is true. Mm -hmm. I think this is actually just the sort of self-deception that is a worry when science and religion do co-mingle, is that, I mean, I can't see, for example, why historical claims, claims about things claims about things that happen in the Bible, for example, shouldn't be subject to exactly the same tests of evidence um, as anything else. That's the scientific method at work in every area of our life. Yes. And I feel that some, just you know, let, just sometimes, let finish, Professor Wilkinson, I'll bring sometimes it back in. people who say things like that um, are, are the victims of self-deception. I mean, as I say, Francesca is the biblical scholar, so she'll have more but to say But do you think Professor Wilkinson's a victim of self-deception? It sounded like, like that from what he was saying then. I think so. And Francesca's nodding, which means uh, gives me <laughs> support. <laughs> for that. Backing. Professor Wilkinson, and what's the evidence your for response? Yeah, the I think the too. historical evidence does need to be sifted. I'm not uh, arguing against that, and I really take exception to being called self-deceived yeah. on this. I teach theology. I'm part of a, a university at Durham which takes theology and historical evidence within the Bible extremely seriously and takes the academic component of that extremely seriously. But you do seriously. teach theology, which is about religious belief, whereas I teach biblical studies, which is about the examination of ancient literature. So I do think we're approaching the evidence, as it were, from, from quite different perspectives. There's no evidence for a resurrection. Professor Wilkinson, we'll have to leave it there for the moment, but thank you. I wanted to ask the one thing implicit in Professor Wilkinson's comments is the idea that religion gives a moral compass. And on issues like, say, fertility treatment, scientists can do all kinds of things, mm. but we have panels with religious people on them to draw an ethical framework. Um, no, don't we need no. religion to no, do no, that? Absolutely, no. absolutely not. I mean, sometimes, I, sometimes I think that um, religious organisations and representatives on those panels can have a deeply immoral effect by importing their own beliefs that come from scriptures and affecting the moral lives of people well, today. I, why, for example, why, for example, with 80% of people in this country supporting assisted dying for the term Leal, to take an example, why is it that ethicists, you know, in the media, ethicists who are often, often religious, again and again, say no, people shouldn't be allowed to have assisted dying. Look, it's not because they care about individuals' choices, it's not because they're moral, it's because some scripture tells them that this is a thing th to I do. I think That's there's a slide, that's a slide is potentially going on here but between saying whether a religious uh, authority should have some kind of say in the matter which I think the answer is yes mm -hmm. versus whether one should just automatically believe what they say which is an, a more contested issue but I do think one of the values that religion does pose in these kind of tricky moral issues is a clear sense of what a human being is and what a human being is for and how it's placed in the universe. Well, I think that's incredibly damaging because most of the main religions share well, the basic values. you're going to have to take a view on it somehow. Francesca, but uh, but uh, most, Francesca most of the main religions share a sense of what basic human decency and, and being communal with each other is. You don't, well, most of them share the same ideas only, about uh, the value uh, of life. You don't need a particular religious tradition to tell you no, whether it's right do, or wrong to have an abortion in that But the religions tend to be quite clear about, on things where secular people are quite fuzzy and are quite e you know, quite easily have a very laissez-faire attitude. Well, flip it round, though. I'm taking the American example where President Bush put a restriction on stem cell research for his religious reasons. Can't it work the other way, that religion closes down things that most society agrees we should be doing? Like I say, one has to take these claims on their face. In other words, I don't say we should just be bowing down to particular religious views. I think part of the issue here is whether religion should have any say in the discussion, because I took what Andrew was saying was basically to try to rule religion out from actually having no. a say. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not.
two things. First of all, I don't think that clarity is always the best thing. Sometimes we have to accept that um, you know, uh, moral questions are very complicated. True, religious traditions may have you know, commendably clear and strict um, rules and very clear views, but clarity is not always what we want. We want sometimes you know, some acceptance that there's you know, greys in an argument. Very but beautiful. I don't want to keep religious people out of the discussion, out of the argument at all. I just want to prevent the ethical views of one particular group preventing the ethical decisions of another group. Majority. Majority. Well, this is about democracy. I want to bring in one other contributor, if I can. Alam Shaha is the author of The Young Atheist's Handbook. He's a physics teacher and was brought up um, as a strict yes. Muslim, but is now, as we can tell from the book title, an atheist and a scientist. What's your view in brief on where we are? Do you think there is a danger posed to society by, by the power of religion? Is it, is it damaging science teaching? Uh, I've been really uh, kind of upset at the fact that none of the scientists have put forward in any evidence really that religion is damaging science. I teach many religious students who go on to university to study science and I think they're perfectly capable of holding those two ways of looking at the world simultaneously because people do that. You know, we all have cognitive dissonance. There is an issue of intellectual compatibility in terms of the different ideas that children grow up with, but we do a great disservice to children by thinking that they can't cope with that, that they can't actually learn how to arrive at their own ways of looking at the world. And ultimately, that's what it boils down to. You're not concerned about the power of children. I mean, you've talked about being brought up in a strict way, the fear of hell, taboos about what you can eat. Does that not worry you that religion is affecting children that way? Is that right in a modern but look, world? I, I, I grew up to be an atheist. I'm, I'm evidence of the fact that a good education can give you the freedom to think for yourself. Excellent. Excellent. Alan, That's thank what it you. should do. Um, I mean, do you think that, that, that the debate is getting a bit harder between religion and um, Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I don't believe in religion, but I don't necessarily believe in science. I see and science now is the very modern Western world's answer to, you know, lots of different questions that people have been wrestling with for years. So what do you but believe in? <laughs> you know what? Sorry. We really can't, can you can answer anything you don't believe, I believe in, God. in the goodness of people. You don't right. need okay. religious authorities but to tell you the way the world is. That. Well, it's not a bad place to start, is it? It's Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. A couple of your contributions on this. Uh, Tom, faith is what you rely on when you don't care about the evidence. That's why religion teaches us nothing and science does. Rob, religion deals with how people hope or fear things are. Science looks at the reality and an anonymous one, science without religion is blind and religion without science is lame. I think someone very famous said that. Kant, yeah. it's a paraphrase of Kant. Yeah, of Kant, there you go. Mm. I don't think it was right. Kant who was emailing <laughs> in though with that one. <laughs> anyway, later on Sunday Morning Live. As four Christians appeal to the European Court of Human Rights about what they see as an attack on their religious freedoms, we ask, are Christians being persecuted in Britain? You can join in by webcam or make your views known by phone, email or online. And remember, keep voting too in our poll. The question, should we be allowed to use any force to protect our homes? If you think you should, then text the word vote followed by yes. If you think you shouldn't, then text vote followed by no. Our text number is 81771 and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You've got about five minutes before the poll closes or you can vote online by visiting our website. It's time for our moral moment. And this week we're giving our panellists a sneak preview of analysis of faith in Britain commissioned for the BBC Religion and Ethics Festival, Rethink, which is taking place in Salford this Wednesday and Thursday. And I'll be chairing some of the discussion if you're coming. The research has thrown up some interesting facts about young people and religion in British society. Two thirds of 16 to 25 year olds claim they don't belong to any religion. And young white British citizens are the ethnic group least likely to belong to a religion. Um, Andrew, you've had a chance to look at some of the stats you all have. I mean, what are your thoughts about what this says about the status and the importance of religion in Britain today? I think what's most interesting about it, I mean, it's an analysis of existing data. So we already knew a lot of the facts that are, that, that are in there. We knew, for example, that young people are really unlikely to be a member of, of any religion. What's interesting is the analysis that now sort of maps that trend over time. So we can see that it's not just that when they grow up there, you know, and get older, they are likely to believe in religion. It's not the case that young people don't believe in religion and old people are more likely to. It's actually a generational effect. So the decline of religious identification, and not in this uh, survey, but in other surveys, there's also been similar data for belief um, and practice as well as identity. The decline is long term and looks pretty terminal. It overall. is interesting, Stephen. I also want, as an, you know, someone with an American background, and in America, you know, there is much more religious observance. What do you make of the fact that it does seem to be declined? And a big generational difference. Younger people much less likely to have a religious affiliation. 
Well, uh, the first thing I would, the first point I would make about uh, surveys of this kind is that they are really looking for membership in well-organized churches and religious groups. Uh, in a sense, this survey doesn't really address the more general issue whether people believe in God or have some kind of spirituality. I think there's more data that will be released next yeah, week. And, yes. and, and, and so in a sense, I think we, we need, this is, a, this is a question about the institutionalization of, of belief. And I'm not surprised by the figures myself. Um, I think there's a sense in which religion uh, in, in this kind of survey is primarily providing a kind of sense of cultural identity. Um, and if cultural identity can be gotten somewhere other than, in, than the faith, let's say through other aspects of secular society, uh, then I think that that is uh, where the identification will come and there won't be a need for religion. Now, the United States, you asked me about yeah. the United States, and it seems to me there, of course, there is still very strong uh, religious cultural identification. If you look at the two uh, nominating conventions for both political parties that have taken place in the past couple of weeks. Both of them invoke God in very serious ways and have been trying to mobilize various religious groups and so forth. Now the interesting thing of course about the United States in this context is that it has official separation of church and state. But one of the consequences of that has been to allow for a kind of flourishing of lots of different religious groups which then as it were, okay. occupy a lot of the cultural and political space. I just want to bring it back to obviously the surveys about Britain. I mean, what's your view? You're quite interested in what it says about the status of the Church of England, weren't you, compared to other groups? Yeah, one of the some of the stats were quite interesting and suggested that, um, to me, it sort of reflected the idea that if younger generations don't seem to affiliate themselves with right British religion, which historically is Church of England, I mean, I think it reflects the fact that the Church of England is pretty much this kind of decaf diet coke kind of christianity Dilute. now it's a bit wishy-washy there's nothing appealing about it to well, i think younger people i mean that's interesting with that and, and briefly i noticed that with the ethnicity breakdowns 97 percent of young bangladeshis under 25 and 95 percent of young pakistanis said they had a strong religious mm. identity indians um mm. too so is i mean is that an interesting statistic about ethnicity is that as steve was saying about cultural identity more or is that religious observance i think perhaps it reflects more sort of social context i mean we're a very urban society now in britain and i think multiculturalism in these you know major cities i think perhaps it there's a different kind of identity that young white British people are, are, are taking from their, you know, from their culture and their society than perhaps different sorts of ethnic groups who, for whom perhaps you know, second or third generation families have more we, of a sense of identity. Sadly, we have to leave it there, but I know there'll be more research on this out on Wednesday. Thank you all very much. Well, you've been voting in our poll this morning. Should we be allowed to use any amount of force to protect our homes? The poll is closing now, so please don't text as your vote won't count, but you may still be charged. The online vote is now closing as well, and we'll bring you the result at the end of the programme. Now, four British Christians have gone to the European Court of Human Rights appealing against what they see as religious discrimination in the workplace. They include a check-in clerk who clashed with British Airways over wearing a cross and a registrar who said she couldn't carry out civil partnerships. Andrew Marsh of Christian Concern believes their cases show Christianity itself is under threat in Britain. We were just talking about this is his Sunday stand. Many of us think of Britain as a Christian country, but I believe that a new aggressive form of atheism is in danger of making us an anti-Christian country. For centuries, Christianity has provided the house in which we, as a society, live. Christianity has given rise to our common values, our laws, our freedoms. But now that house is under attack. A new form of secularism has arisen. It's atheistic, aggressive and antagonistic. It tells us that Christianity is a danger to our society, a virus that needs to be eradicated. It is seeking to dismantle our Christian heritage and to remove expressions of Christianity from public life. And it reserves special hostility for those who dare to stand up against it. Christian nurses, doctors, foster carers, a magistrate, teachers, local council workers have been pushed out of their jobs. This new aggressive atheism, preaching its doctrine of survival of the fittest, is producing a society that is increasingly cold, competitive and cruel. I fear for what our children will inherit if this tide is not reversed.
Well, you can join in by webcam or make your point by phone, text, email or online. And I'm delighted to say we're joined by Andrew Marsh of Christian Concern, who made that film. It's an organisation campaigning, uh, they say, to infuse a biblical worldview into every aspect of society. I'm sure you enjoyed our last discussion. <laughs> um, Andrew, I mean, to start with you then, I mean, yeah. are we in danger? If you take his, his, his perspective seriously, are we not in danger of becoming anti-Christian in a way in this country? Absolutely not. And I think I, ca I can't... I can't see any evidence or any reason to believe almost any of the assertions or claims that were made in that video just now. I think it's completely the opposite of reality. Firstly, um, I don't think that it's the case um, that uh, Christianity is somehow a victim or under attack or that, you know, this house... It's an interesting metaphor given the first discussion today, the idea that the house of Christianity is under attack. The question being what force presumably is proportionate to use in and who's the victim? It defense, exactly. Who's the victim? I mean, Christianity is, is not being attacked in that sort of structural um, political way in this country. Quite the opposite. Look, just look at a few um, examples of how Christianity still retains Very enormous power. Examples, okay, please. just one, one quick example then. Look at our state funded schools. A third of our state funded schools are run um, by religious groups, most of them uh, by the Church of England. Um, there are bishops in our parliament. Christianity retains a political power totally out of proportion to the number of people in the country um, who are Christian. And a lot of this. Um, sort of fiction about Christians being persecuted, I think, is a narrative designed to whip up a sort of reaction amongst Christians. Andrew Marsh, take that. Well, the issue is, is about trajectory. It's about the direction of travel. There's no denying that we still enjoy many aspects of our Christian heritage for, for the good of all, but things have changed. And I think there is a deliberate agenda, and it's been particularly uh, prevalent in the last decade or so, that presents Christianity as uh, hostile and as a danger to society and that has actually caused a widespread anxiety uh, in society more generally also allowed Christianity to be ridiculed and not given the chance to respond uh, but uh, there is a hostility in these cases that have gone to the European Court of Human Rights are very unusual for the European Court of Human Rights uh, to hear Article 9 freedom of uh, thought and that's remember what we're talking about freedom of thought conscience and religion very few cases admitted and these cases have I just want to bring in Francesca only... briefly because a lot of the detail of these cases is in the detail in, in the case of BA Clark she later got permission to wear it the BA just changed the rules so is there a sense that that Christians perhaps are trying to make a visual point about their identity in a, in a way that perhaps Muslims do because they wear a scarf or, or absolutely, I mean, turban. absolutely. I think one of the biggest things about the case with the BA woman was the fact that she was allowed to wear the cross, but just underneath her clothes. Um, she claimed she was being persecuted and discriminated against, and she compared herself to Muslim women who are able to, well, crucially, to wear. Crucially, British Airways changed the rules subsequently, and she can now, and everyone can wear these things. Absolutely. So why is she going to, you know, I mean, there's a question of, is that really religious discrimination if the problem has been sorted? Well, Andrew? the problem was as a result of media coverage, I think, around this case, and British Airways took a sensible decision, and that's good. We but welcome that. was it persecution that. if the well, problem was sorted? Well, I think this is, the, this, is the, this is the critical issue. The critical issue at stake in these cases is whether these four Christian individuals could have been respected and their Christian faith uh, accommodated without any risk of damage or detriment. But in the end, it was. Right, and the reality that, is, they could have been. I'm so sorry, but I think in uh, the context of the Western world, where Christianity is still the main cultural religion, to claim persecution and discrimination when, in other parts of the world, religious and non-religious groups really are yeah, being persecuted, really are being discriminated against, I think it's it's bordering and, and offensive. It is, I mean, I, I I agree with that, and I also think that it's worth saying that these cases, you know, are, they've been lost again and again and again in the English courts, and they've been lost frequently because courts have found but, that there isn't any persecution or discrimination yeah, going here. But again and again, let political Christian lobby finish, groups have used them to create a totally false narrative of persecution. It's actually good for your cause when these cases. Are lost you know the more they're lost and the more it shows that people you know okay, let, let Andrew Bosch yeah. respond to let me that come back briefly, to that point yeah. in a second first Francesca's point just about the persecution yes absolutely uh, there are not Christians being killed in this country and we give great thanks for that we do remember that uh, more Christians lose their lives for their faith than any other uh, religious believers around the world but the reality of these cases is that people are losing jobs, livelihoods, reputation and career. Right. And if, if just make a quick analogy, if you have two people with cancer and one is in the early stages and one is in the latter stages, of course this is the one that you give attention to and devote attention to helping them. But you don't say, well, that's, uh, that's no problem that's at all, we'll just see how it works that's out. That's outrageous It's analogy. about dealing with because the issue. No. And these cases highlight what is happening. They do not. Just for they, are do not they are being abused. All of us. They do not highlight what is happening because they do not demonstrate Christian persecution. They are taken, they are taken strategically the, and the persecution layer is added on by the media no. and by lobby groups like yours. We have to leave that just for a minute because I want to bring in a couple of contributors 
contributors. We have Catherine Heseltine joining us from the Muslim Public Affairs Committee. Um, what do you make of the idea that Christians are sort of, you know, exaggerating a situation for their own agenda? Well, as a Muslim, I can understand what it's like to have religious beliefs that are important to you and to want to live in accordance with uh, those beliefs. And I think Muslims will feel um, solidarity with Christians who want to safeguard their rights to, to practice their religion. Uh, in fact, in Islam, um, Christians have a, a very special status as people of the book. We share the same Abrahamic tradition, believe in the same prophets. So, protecting Not in the, the Muslim the countries rights, necessarily, uh, though, Catherine. I'm sure you'd agree, like Saudi Arabia. But according to, to the Quran, uh, Christians have this, this special status as, as people who work alongside Jews and, uh, uh, and, and I know, Christians. But briefly, we're focusing on how it works in law. Do you, do you think that Christians are sort of fighting back because maybe they think Muslims have a special status? Sharia law is being talked about as having a special status, headscarves and so on. Well, I see, see this as, as something where we have issues in common when it comes to religious dress. I can personally emphasize, because my headscarf doesn't affect my ability to do my job at all, equally, okay. a Christian wearing their crucifix, it doesn't stop them doing their, their job well, and therefore to, to sack them for, for, for wearing it would be pure discrimination. All right. and Catherine, I want to leave it there just for a moment, because I want to bring in, thank you, I want to bring Peter Tatchell, the human rights activist. Uh, Peter, you're familiar uh, with, you know, the issues of, of groups who've been regarded as marginalised or, or persecuted in the past. Do you have sympathy with, with cases like these Christians going to the European court? Well, I... I think the issue is one of freedom of expression. So I would defend the right of people of faith to wear discrete religious symbols. But I do have some anxiety about what door that might open. If Christians can wear symbols, why not supporters of the BNP or EDL? I would hate to see that. You know, that, that would be very, very offensive and uh, threatening to many people. Um, there's also, of course, this issue about persecution. Um, I concur totally. Um, Christians are not being persecuted in this country, and it's an insult to the Christians who are being persecuted in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and elsewhere, who I support and defend. Those are real victims of persecution in this country. Christians are not being persecuted. They are simply being denied the right to discriminate against others that they used to. For example, until fairly recently with the new anti-discrimination laws, Christians used to be able to discriminate against Muslims and Jews, gay people and women. Now the law says they can't, to deny them the right to discriminate is not persecution. It's saying that Christians should abide by the equality laws like everyone else. Peter, let me put that to Andrew Marsh. There are equality laws that our democracies agreed on. If someone doesn't want to do a civil partnership, then they should change jobs, is the argument Peter's making. I think the issue is about how we can balance various rights. And there is strong protection under the European Convention of Human Rights for freedom of thought conscience and religion. But when it clashes with the law, and the law says gay people are entitled well, to get counselling and they're entitled to a civil partnership, well, mm. you're saying, no, well, I don't have to do no, so if I don't take, believe in gay people's let, rights. Let's take the... De and this is where the detail of these cases is important, I think. The issue... It's the principle. No, the, the detail of the cases, because if we take someone like Gary McFarlane, uh, he was a relationships counsellor. He gave relationships counselling to anyone who would come to him. He began to undertake a training course in a very specific form of sex therapy, psychosexual sex thera uh, uh, therapy. In the process of that course, he expressed that he might have a hesitation about giving sex therapy so to homosexual couples. It was theoretical. Couples. It was theoretical. The, the situation had never arisen. It was in the context of a private... He was being this honest. This is contested. Right. Work, this, is, work this, is, this, this is contested. contested. I mean, it's difficult. That he Anybody... was expressing his view yeah. and wasn't okay, actually refusing and this is right. the policing to treat of someone. No, that's that's the I'm, I mean, you know, that is, OK, we can't get into all the facts of the cases because no. they're cases that have gone through the employment tribunal and then the appeal tribunal and but then the courts the and they're complicated. The principle is it is about thought rather if, than breaking the No, it's not. If a councillor who has, you know, signed on when he signed is a contract of employment, for example, to say that he will abide by equal opportunities and treat people equally. If that person then says, I am not going to, I would, would not, would not or will not, even would not, I would not um, give treatment to people because I didn't agree with their lifestyle or I was happy to discriminate against them on the basis of sexual orientation or race or disability or whatever, then that is unacceptable. And it's certainly, you know, an employer saying, oh, I'm sorry, you've breached your um, uh, contract of employment, so we'll have to uh, not have you here anymore. That certainly doesn't amount to religious persecution right. of Christians against. I want to bring in Rob Joy here, who's a pastor. Um, you, what's your view on the law? Would you break it if you felt it conflicted with your Christian belief? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not one of my life's ambitions, but obviously, um, as, a, as a Christian, as a passionate Christian, I believe that the word of God is final. 
And if the law contradicted that, then for me it's the word of God every time. And as a, an ex-career criminal and an ex-drug addict, I know that the gospel of Jesus Christ was the only message, after searching for many other messages, that was able to set me free. And so I believe passionately in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I believe that no law will change it. And Is there no anything in British law it. that you wouldn't do? For example, would you refuse to counsel a gay couple or offer sex therapy as part of your job? I, I, would, I, would, I would welcome anybody into my church and into my office for counselling and stuff. But yeah, I do believe that the word of God is final. And the okay. word of God does promote man and wife. Well, thank you, and Andrew. Not two thank men you, or two Coxon. women. Okay. And, 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 so, and then another question for Rob is: Would he be willing to bear the consequences? I mean, take take an analogy. I might really, really want to be a vicar, you know, because you get a house and you get a nice, you know, job and you get to talk to people and help people. I can't be a vicar because I don't believe, you know, in the Christian God and I'm not willing to lie about it. So I accept the burden of my beliefs that I can't be a vicar. Employment opportunity denied. It's a shame, but um, there it Andrew is. Andrew Copson, so, got to. Uh, I've just got to say, with the example of the Church of England, you know, they're still dithering about whether or not to have women bishops. Anywhere else in law, the idea that you couldn't have a woman boss Absolutely. would be illegal. Aren't there enough opt-outs for religion um, without, without trying to impose them into civil, into civil society? No, the, the, this is about uh, the importance of religion. So in the European Convention of Human Rights, there are strong protections for freedom of thought, conscience and religion. And the reason for that is that it's widely recognised that those things are important for a civilised society and for protecting other freedoms. So you're freedoms. saying we've got the balance so, wrong? Yeah, and I think one of the reasons that these cases uh, have had to go to Europe is because there is an attitude issue with not recognising the the value of the, our Christian heritage and the freedoms that, that in okay. the bigger picture, because it actually gives us a foundation and a framework for our society. Okay, Francesca, I think this basically you. reflects um, the fact that there's a bit of a disinterest in the Church of England and its, and its Christian culture in this country at the moment. There has been for quite a few years, as those stats demonstrated. And within Christianity, and particularly in what's called the Gospel of Jesus by, by Rob there, um, there's a sense in which Christians need to be prepared in the New Testament for persecution. This is all about modern day Christians try to identify with their Christian ancestors and to make themselves feel a little we bit We have to leave shallow. it there, I'm sorry, but I think we, everyone's had to go. I think we tried to be fair. I want a couple of viewers' uh, comments. Uh, anonymous one, people are being made to feel ashamed for being Christians. It's not acceptable. Uh, make a change from Britain being persecuted by... I'm not sure I read that one. Uh, Sarah says, turning small mole hole issues into mountains of persecution does Christianity no favours at all. Thank you all so much. Um, we have to end it there because your text and online poll votes are in. Uh, we asked, should we be allowed to use any force to protect our homes? And here's what you're told is very strong views as in our last discussion. 97% of you who voted said yes, any amount of force to protect your home. 3% say no. I'm going to give you the first word on that, Andrew Marsh, very briefly. Are you surprised at all? Uh, no, because I think that we recognise that um, people and our property uh, are important and this is a difficult area. Uh, okay. Andrew Copson. Um, well, I would hope that that would reflect people's um, belief that there is a response that's justified but that it should be proportionate. I hope that if you'd ask the question, is it important that that should be proportionate, people would also okay. have said yes. Francesca. I'm surprised these people aren't in church at this time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Turning the other cheek. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's very interesting. It's also it in. perception, it in. isn't it, in advance. Um, go on, have another go. You've got another 20 seconds. Go on. Uh, in. <laughs> just on, on that it. issue, I mean, do you have any sympathy with people who worry that it just ups the I, I, th I think there are, there are risks involved, but we recognise that that is an infringement and if we, uh, of property and people, and those are important to protect in a free democracy. So reasonable, last resort. Thank you, Andrew Marsh. Thanks to all of you who've taken part in today's discussions. To Francesca Stavrakopoulou, to Andrew Copson, to Andrew Marsh, and to Steve Fuller and to Malcolm Starr, who were with us earlier on the programme. And thanks to all our contributors who took part via a webcam and phone. Don't text or call the phone lines anymore. They are now closed. But you can continue the conversation online. The links are all on our website. Now, Sunday Morning Live is not here next week because of the Great North Run, but we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you so much for your company. Goodbye. Enjoy the natural beauty, culture and wildlife of North Wales next on BBC One with Country Tracks.
These kids are growing up on one of Britain's toughest estates. We're thugs, yeah, but we've come from the gutter, you know what I mean? But can they really be blamed for their behaviour? It's not fair, is it? Kids are brought up between drugs and hate. Filming with families, the police and undercover, Panorama investigates trouble on the estate, Tuesday at 9 on BBC One. Rome's empire was built on the might of its legions, but you can't understand the history of Rome until you understand its monuments. Just imagine the kind of message that buildings like this must have sent out. And you thought all the Romans did was fight. Treasures of Ancient Rome continues tomorrow at 9 on BBC4. Brand new for Monday nights is the return of new tricks. Well, well, well. The same drama and intrigue. Eleanor's version of events doesn't fit with the forensic evidence. But this time, it's personal. Whether you like it or not, Jack has gone. And we can't do all this by ourselves. How will they solve this one? Any possible Jack replacements yet? Not as yet, no. There's got to be someone. Brand new New Tricks continues tomorrow at 9 on BBC One and BBC One HD. Country File explores the Furness Peninsula in Cumbria at 7.30 tonight.